Hey guys, it's Ariel over here at Fineth. It's a beautiful sunny day, the first we've had in a long time. My snow walls are even deeper than my last video. Um, almost level with the eaves there. I wanted to talk today about can you live in a tiny house in cold weather? Obviously the short answer is yes. This is my tiny, I live here, and uh, we've got pretty crazy winter. Um, it's usually very wintry here, usually a lot of snow, and this is above average for us. So anyway, here's a few things you might want to think about if you are planning to live in a tiny house in cold weather. Number one, if it's going to snow a lot, shoveling gets to be a big deal. My snow walls here are higher than my head, by a couple feet now. Um, and I like shoveling, but I have to do a lot of it. Things I have to be able to get to. My little shed down there, because it's got gas cans, which I use for my generator, water bottles that I use to fill my water tank, etc. In the summer, it's very nice to not have those things right up against the house. Even in the winter, I wouldn't want to keep gas cans in the house. But, since my shed's over there, that whole path has to stay shoveled. Come this way. This goes out to my driveway. This is where I can... Uh, get to my vehicle and hence out to the road, so that has to stay shoveled. Come back this way, um, along the side of the house. You would think I could just shovel out my doorway. You can see my handy little shovel there. But, and this is the main thing you might want to do differently if you could, there are other things I have to keep accessible. My doorway, I actually need to shovel off the windows there again so that water doesn't melt into the windowsills. I have to keep the um, vent for my built-in heater shoveled out and open. Then I go a little bit further. I have to keep access to my propane tanks open because I may need to get to them, uh, change uh, from one tank to another, or possibly fill them. Hopefully I should not need to fill any of them until next spring anyway, but I still have to be able to move the gas line from one to another. So I have to get to there. On around the house, I have to keep the vent open for my water heater. That's where um, it's a propane heater and that's where it vents to the outside, so that has to stay open. I have to be able to put water in my water tank. That happens right here, so that has to stay open. Then here, sometimes I have to clean ash or uh, creosote out of my chimney in my wood stove videos. Um, if you've seen those or my blog posts about that, I've talked about how I get less, but I still sometimes have to be able to check on and clean that, so I've got to have this accessible. Got one more propane tank here. Um, needs dusted off again since the roof slid on it. Um, that goes to my secondary heater. Need to, again to be able to access that. Need to be able to access the little box with my generator in it. Um, right here. Peek in there at that. Um, and that brings me back around to the front of my house. So because I've got things every few feet around the whole house um, that need to be accessible, I have to keep the entire thing shoveled, which is a good bit of work on a winter like this. Um, I think my area's got 54 inches of snow from this last storm over the last few days until these beautiful blue skies came out this morning. Um, so that's a lot of work. If you can design the inside of your house so that all of those things are on one side or one end or in one spot, um, that would save you from having to shovel the entire perimeter of your house to access a different thing at each different point. Um, also, if you put your shed or whatever outside storage you have. If you live off-grid, you probably are going to have some things that can't be in the house. Um, put that a little closer. That would help. Um, the other thing I have to be able to get to is my wood pile. Um, I could have put this closer to the house. There's no reason I couldn't have, but it's over here because these trees are so thick you can see this trail is actually deep this winter. Most winters there's only a few inches of snow under these trees, um, but even this winter that is significantly less than this. Um, the trees just block most of it, so it seems like a good place to put the wood pile, but since it's snowing I now have to keep that shoveled out too. And then lastly, and I don't always shovel this, but I gotta at least be able to break a trail 
that sun doesn't blind you. Um, there's my solar panels. They're up there because I live on the shady side of the hill, but when it snows, they often have to be dusted off. And even if the snow will slide off itself, I still have to get up there and shovel it away from the bottom of them, where it piles up into a heap so big that they can't, um, that the snow can't go anywhere when it does slide off. So that is a lot of different things to keep open. Um, that would be the first thing I would say to think about what all you're going to need to access in the winter and um, how, how you can lay it out so that whatever you do need will be more accessible. Next, let's go inside where it's toasty warm. I do not have any problem keeping my house warm. That is a fairly frequent question um, that I get when people see the amount of snow. Keeping my house warm is not at all difficult. It's like 70 in here now. Often it's 90 because I've got this little wood stove. Um, you can see my wood box I just filled up. That will make this place plenty, plenty hot. Um, as a backup, because a wood stove, especially a small one, will go out when you're gone or asleep. Um, and I do work, so I leave the house and it will go out and get cold. I have two other options. There's this thermostat that controls um, a built-in direct vent heater. It's got a vent down here at the bottom of the stairs, one on that side. There's another one back there in the bathroom. So if my stove goes out and the house gets down to like 50, where I've got that set, um, that heater will come on. Also, I have this little heater I added before I had the wood stove. Um, this is a uh, catalytic propane heater. It does a great job of heating. It's a nice radiant heat, but it also produces a good bit of moisture because it's not vented to the outside and burning propane produces moisture. Now this is great when I know that it's going to be negative 30 overnight. I'm going to have my stove burning until I go to bed. It's nice and toasty, but I know it's going to go out because I'm going to sleep like seven or eight hours. Um, so when I go to bed, even though this is hot, I'll just turn this on low for the evening and it the house won't be cold when I get up. Um, and running the wood stove most of the time makes that possible because of the moisture issue. Now moisture is another thing you definitely want to think about um, if you are going to live in a cold area. I didn't think of condensation as being a big issue because I live in a dry climate so why would I have condensation? But especially in a small space, in a well-sealed space, um, you're going to get a lot of condensation, most likely, because you breathe. Human beings exhale a fairly amazing amount of moisture just through breathing and evaporation off of our skin during the course of a day. Um, so that adds a lot of moisture. If you cook, that adds a lot of moisture. If you um, heat with propane, that adds a good bit of moisture. So all of those things will give you a lot of condensation. I'll show you in a minute here. Um, before I installed my wood stove, I had constant condensation all around my window frames. They're wood frames. Uh, the, the wood was constantly damp out to like here, um, which made it start to mold. So I still have some mold stains. The mold's dead. It's not come back. But if you don't have a very dry heat source like a wood stove, then if you live in a cold area, you are going to need a humidifier and the electricity to run it or um, probably and a direct, um, I'm trying to think what they're called, direct vent um, heat, ex heat recovery system where it kind of circulates air through your house without just like opening two windows and blowing out all of your heat. Um, but that helps uh, eliminate some of the humidity. But that is something you're very much going to have to think about. I'm certainly not the only tiny houser that's had issues with humidity. Um, it just, it's part of having a very small space, especially if it's well sealed. There's polyurethane spray foam in my walls, which makes them well insulated, um, very warm in here. That's like an R21 insulation um, in the walls, floor, ceilings. Um, so that's great, but it does not let any kind of moisture or air get through. For ventilation, I, and because I like to sleep cool, I have a loft window open just a crack almost all the time up in my sleeping loft. Um, and I have a curtain now hung across there so my wood stove heat doesn't just all go racing out that window. It lets me sleep cooler, which um, works for me at least to get a better night's sleep. 
and I always have plenty of fresh air up there and it lets the air circulate a bit. And again, my wood stove makes the house so hot that the heat loss is not a big deal. Um, I can burn excess wood. I live in a place that has hundreds and hundreds of cords of beetle kill standing dead trees. Um, so I don't feel at all wasteful to burn as much wood as I want to make my house super hot, open the windows if it's too hot, um, because all those trees are simply going to burn up in a wildfire sooner or later if they're not cut and burned. Um, in a contained manner in a wood stove, they're going to be a wildfire that um, just totally wipes out an area, destroys the wildlife in that area, and so on. So, and wildfires have their place. But anyway, I don't feel any need to conserve my wood resource. That would be a little different if you had to buy your firewood. I can cut my own, so it's virtually free if I don't count my labor. Um, or if you live in an area where there is less wood, very easily accessible like that. Um, so that's something to think about. But for me, conserving wood, saving it is not at all an issue. Um, some other things to think about are how are you going to keep water lines from freezing? That's one I get a lot of questions about. I don't keep my water lines from freezing. I don't have water lines because my um, because I'm off grid. I'm not connected to any external water source, and that allows me to just have um, over there in the corner of the sink. I've got an internal tank. As long as the house stays above freezing, that's going to stay above freezing, um, and all of my plumbing is in like two feet from that tank to the sink. Um, the only thing that goes outside is the drain. Um, I'll link in my post with this to my blog post about the one time I did freeze up my drain and how that happened and why and how to keep that from happening. But generally, the water going down my sink drain is warm. Even if it's not hot water, it's at least room temperature water, which is significantly warmer than the freezing point. And so it, um, it simply drains out. My water drains onto the ground. I live on top of a very rocky hillside here. Um, and so it just vanishes into the ground. It does not pull. It does not create an odor. I'm very careful with what I put in my gray water. Um, but it because it's warm, it gets onto the drain and into the ground before it freezes up. So I've not had an issue with that except for that one um, instance. So that um, is how I keep my water lines from freezing. If you live somewhere really cold and you've got a uh, hose or something like that that feeds your house... Um, you're going to have to figure out something about that if you live, like I said here, we've had several weeks now in the negative 20s or negative 30s. Um, I think it's supposed to be negative 14 tonight. There, I don't know that even a heated um, heat tape wrapped hose would keep a um, garden hose thawed out in those kinds of temperatures. So at that point, if that's your setup, you're probably going to look have to look at both heating it and burying it or insulating it better in some kind of way or consider just carrying your water by hand for the really cold months or if you don't have cold months if you get one cold week it might especially be worth just carrying the water and not having to worry about it um that's what i do all the time so that's that's not a change for me um other things to do with living in a very cold place um is it hard to heat no is it um can it take the snow weight on the roof? That's another one I get a lot. I've got a metal roof. It's fairly small because the house is so small. So, you know, from each point down, it's really small. It sheds all of the time. Um, usually every storm or multiple times during a storm. Um, the dormers are at a more shallow angle, so they don't shed quite as fast as the main part of the house because of its steeper angle. Um, but that roof can withstand a lot of weight, and it never gets a chance to get a lot of weight on it. Um, that even when, if you see my pictures, it looks really puffy and like there's this much snow, which there can be. Um, most of the time our snow is very light and there is not, especially if you're from the East Coast. I grew up in Pennsylvania. If you're picturing a heavy wet snow weight of this deep, that's not what I've got on my roof um, because we get a very dry, fluffy snow, the kind of thing that you can clean a foot off your car with a broom easily. Um, so roof weight has not been an issue, um, but you would want to make sure you've got a roof that sheds snow easily and at an angle where it will do that um, if you're going to live somewhere with deep snow. Um, I mentioned it, or just uh, saw it when I was doing the tour outside. Uh, if you have solar power in the winter, you are going to have to be able to get to your panels, which is, for one, why they're not on my roof. Um, and they're going to have to be somewhere sunny, which my roof is not in the winter. In the summer, I get lots of sun, but because of the angle on the north side of the hill, um, my roof gets virtually no sunlight on it in the middle of winter, which is why the solar panels are that far away. Also, you'll have weeks like the last, oh, it's been seven or eight days since we had a sunny day like today, 
where it was snowing heavily every day or super gray, um, you get almost no sunlight. So you would need, if you're going to be off grid and have uh, solar power, you are going to need a little generator like I've got as backup, unless you're willing to just use no electricity when you get a stretch of snowy wintry weather. Also, I live fairly far north. I'm in the mountains of northern Wyoming. So um, at this elevation and latitude um, in the winter, you know, our sun line, it's not like Alaska. We don't have solid night, but the sun rises and sets in an arc, you know, something like, well, for the camera, something like this. It does not ever go straight overhead um, or anywhere close to that in the winter. So the sunlight is just somewhat limited. So on snowy weeks like that, I have to start my generator every couple days to top off this battery bank that's under the couch. I have another video about a lot more details in my solar system, but um, that is another factor to consider if you're going off grid in a cold climate. You are going to have to have a backup, um, especially if your heat source requires electricity. Having only, if you have it as a backup, that's fine, but if you have only a heat source that requires electricity and you're off grid in a cold spot, in fact, having one heat source period is probably not a good idea. Um, I do heat primarily with wood, but that wouldn't work when I have to leave the house and go to work or go to sleep. I guess, you know, as far as sleeping, I could set an alarm and get up and restock the stove. But if I have to be at work for eight or nine hours and it's negative 30, and I'm talking Fahrenheit, I live in the United States, um, it's going to go out and the house is going to get cold. Uh, it's easy to heat a small space, but there's not a lot of mass, so small spaces lose heat more rapidly, even with good insulation. So having at least two heat sources, I would say, is important. Having a dry heat like a wood stove is a really good thing, but having something on a thermostat that will kick on or off um, when you're not home is also a good idea, unless you never go anywhere in the winter for more than two or three hours. Or you can put in a monster wood stove. It would burn longer, but then it would cook you right out of the house. Even that little one, which is 12 inches square, um, can easily make this place 95 degrees. Um, I'm not bundled up because it's cold in here, but just because I was walking around outside as well. So those are some of the things to consider if you are going to live in a tiny house in a cold climate. Um, it is certainly possible. I do it. I love it. This is my third winter in my house. Um, it's the snowiest one of the three so far. And um, I really enjoy it. It's fun to watch, you know, the scale of the snow walls getting as high as the house, um, or at least the eaves, not as far as the peak yet. Um, but this is only first half of January, so it could get a lot deeper. Um, but yes, it's very possible, but there are some considerations that you might not think about that um, could make life a little easier especially because this is what I do in relation to living off grid in a very cold and very snowy place. So anyway, that's my thoughts. Um, I'm finding a lot of people from their comments who apparently see only one video and don't know this. So if you're watching this, I do have a blog. I have a YouTube channel. Um, if you've got questions, I try my best to sooner or later answer all of them. But if you check out my other videos and blog posts, a lot of them I have already covered there. And that would save me some time typing uh, answers saying, hey, see this post where I already wrote this down. So anyway, um, follow me, like my channel, find me on Facebook. Uh, my house is named Fineth. Uh, I am Ariel. McLaughlin. You can find me on any of those sources and hope you guys all have a great day. If you have any questions that I can help you with, please do feel free to ask. And like I said, um, sooner or later, usually within a few days, I try to get back to people and answer their questions. So you guys all have a lovely day and I'll talk to you later.